Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. It's a great pleasure um, to welcome Hannes Bronin from the University of Chicago today um, and already an announcement for next week. I was asked to mention that Dirk Englum from MIT will be presenting uh, like this seminar next Wednesday. So uh, Hannes is a very good friend of mine um, from grad school times. So he uh, did his undergrad in Germany at the University of Hanover, then came to the uh, Technical University of Delft for his PhD, where he worked extremely successfully on you know, quantum network prototypes with nitrogen vacancy centers in Diamond, a lot of um, highly decorated work that he launched there. And little known to most people, he's also an award-winning actor from that time. Uh, someone posted a YouTube uh, link in the chat of this meeting where you can see um, you can see, a bit, see him in action. He, won, he actually won an award for that. Just because um, you didn't want to be in front of the camera. <laughs> your idea. <laughs> um, after his uh, PhD in Delft, um, uh, he did. He stayed there for a longer as a postdoc, where he was one uh, part of the team that was one of the first to perform the first locality-free, uh, uh, locality loophole-free bell test experiment. Um, then he moved on to a, to his real postdoc at Harvard with Misha Lukin, where he pioneered work on um, yeah, atom arrays controlled with um, optical tweezers. And since about two years, Hannes is on the faculty at the University of Chicago at the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering, um, where he also started work on neutral atoms. And we're all yeah, very intrigued in hearing what he's up to there. So the floor is yours. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Yeah, great introduction. And it's uh, really special. And uh, yeah, it's really wonderful to be here virtually. Of course, we had this maybe planned for April and it would have been uh, amazing to be there in person, but I do think uh, there will be uh, many opportunities to uh, do that uh, uh, also in the future. And I hope you can see now my slides here. Could I get a thumbs up? Good, good, good. Yeah, good there. All right. So yeah. So I'm. Um, yeah. So now, um, yeah. My talk today. What I will uh, show you is a technique to assemble large quantum systems from the bottom up. And uh, you see this uh, technique um, basically here, where these bright dots, they are single atoms. And I will show you how you can put these single atoms where you want them, how you can engineer interactions between them, let them uh, evolve under these very controlled interactions, and then read out the result. And I'm particularly interested in using these bottom up techniques uh, in order to yeah, build large quantum processors or quantum simulators. And also, I'm still very excited about these quantum network uh, directions that Wolfgang also mentioned from, my, uh, from our uh, time together uh, in Delft, but now uh, using single atoms uh, in this context. Before I uh, really start, I actually want to zoom out a little bit and acknowledge that right now there is, I would say, a huge excitement in general about quantum science and quantum technology I think that's really because yeah, quantum technology promises to revolutionize many different areas, revolutionize the way we develop new materials where maybe quantum effects, entanglement play a large role, also revolutionize how we can sense tiny signals, yeah, for example, using NV centers, hopefully soon also maybe using entanglement to even improve uh, the sensitivity. Of course, it promises yeah, new ways how we could uh, securely communicate in quantum communication. And then, of course, very exciting how we could uh, process information in a quantum computer. This is all uh, really exciting and I find it really fascinating that now this excitement went from academia also to industry and also really uh, to the broad uh, public. And you actually almost every day you read new, uh, yeah, news about quantum computing and yeah, that's uh, really great. Sometimes it's also a little bit um, maybe cringe worthy or sometimes you read something in the news that maybe uh, you don't find so much in the lab and you wonder where it's coming from. So I sometimes for fun collect newspaper articles on quantum computing and here, for example, you see a nice example where scientists have created artificial life on a quantum computer. So maybe there's 
yeah, it's sometimes nice to track down which experiment they actually uh, refer to, but yeah, it does have its own life, I would say, this kind of news. Also, a uh, quantum computer can make history go backwards. Yeah, that was very interesting to see what the people in the experiment actually did here. Uh, but it was very uh, much covered by the New York Times. Also now in a very uh, recent, um, yeah, uh, re in the recent circumstances, quantum computers may help us to save us from the coronavirus. Uh, here, I really like this subheading, let's get quantum on the this pandemic's path. Uh, that would be great. And yeah, from reading these news articles, you really get the impression that there are already quantum computers and these quantum computers, they are actually uh, really, really large maybe with thousands of qubits handling really large, maybe data sets. And, and yeah, I would say this is uh, really not true. I think right now still uh, really, even in the best labs and the best uh, companies, the biggest systems in number of qubits are maybe tens of qubits that you can fully control where you have significant coherence. And of course, uh, maybe one very nice example to point out here is this 53 qubit chip that Google used, I think it was 54, but then they used only 53 uh, to, ran, uh, to run random circuits on, these, uh, on this quantum processor, which were then hard to um, simulate uh, on a classical computer. So that's uh, really uh, astonishing. Um, yeah, it is, but still remains uh, really hard to make large quantum systems. I think there are also a lot of opportunities and I really find it fascinating and uh, very, um, inspiring actually to see how many different approaches there are to making qubits, to making quantum technology. So here's from a news article in Science in 2016, trying to compare different quantum architectures. Sometimes, yeah, these comparisons make more sense or less sense, but yeah, I, I think it's good to uh, get a perspective on this. Of course, you have superconducting qubits, you have trapped ions, silicon quantum uh, dots, you have uh, topological qubits that yeah, maybe have a lot of promise, but yeah, don't really show these numbers uh, yet. And then you have NV center. And this uh, article was from 2016. And I would say since 2016, a lot has happened. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to extend this list a little bit uh, with neutral atom arrays, because I really think that these neutral, neutral atom arrays have a lot of pros in terms of uh, scalability, where you can engineer them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a really uh, yeah, very nice direction to try to engineer these large quantum systems. And I think uh, one really nice hallmark is here, the largest entangled state, a GHC state, uh, was created on these neutral atom arrays. And I will show you later in my talk uh, how that was done. So what is, ah yeah, so um, yeah, atoms, the way I think about atoms, uh, I think of them as really a great, building block for building quantum systems because yeah atoms itself they have very long coherence times these experiments they happen in these ultra high vacuum chambers they're very well isolated from the environment atoms come with decades long of research actually and a really nicely developed toolbox for manipulation detection interaction of course the best plots today they are based on atoms and we can use these technologies that were developed there also in these different contexts of for example, quantum simulation and computation. And then uh, the special thing about this building block, and that's really the thing I really enjoy maybe the most, or which is really special because of maybe this background, uh, my PhD research was on NV centers. And I would say maybe I spent a year or maybe even longer just trying to make two NV centers exactly the same. So when they are exactly the same, we could run all these nice uh, entanglement protocols but it's actually uh, quite hard, just given two uh, solid state emitters to make them uh, the, the same. And maybe there are other materials where that's easier, but uh, it does remain a challenge here for these atomic systems. They are kind of intrinsically the same, so they're indistinguishable. And now what we have nowadays are techniques that we can then really take this building block and copy and paste it into a larger system. And I will uh, show you how this copy paste is done and how you can then have these arrays of atoms here in one dimension, but uh, there are extensions into two and even three dimensions. And then, uh, yeah, if you then also introduce long range interactions that are very coherent on these arrays, and this is a really powerful platform for quantum simulation and computation. And I will show you experiments in this direction. 
And one more feature that I uh, really enjoy about atoms is that they, atoms, of course, they emit light and you can engineer really efficient photonic interfaces. And now you could imagine connecting this array here to a distant array with a photonic channel in between. And that's um, one line of research uh, that we are very excited about. So what will happen today in my talk? First, I'm going to show you how you can generate defect-free atom arrays. And then I'm going to show you uh, how you can introduce coherent interactions between the atoms and use that uh, to create high fidelity entangled states, perform multi-qubit gates on these atoms. And then we are going to go more into this quantum simulation direction, look at spin models, uh, the icing model. But actually, yeah, this quantum simulation, for me, it's never black or white. It's not quantum simulation or quantum computation. It's these things are very much uh, connected and we will actually use here in this part, we will use kind of the um, techniques from this quantum simulation to create very large entangled states. So maybe a very useful resource for quantum computing. And here in this first uh, section, I'm going to present uh, research uh, from my postdoc time at Harvard largely. But then in the last yeah, half or third of my talk, I'm actually going to uh, talk more about what we are doing here uh, at Chicago, which will then use kind of the techniques that I'm introducing here at the top. Okay, great. So let's start. Uh, feel free to interrupt or send a question to Wolfgang, uh, who will then definitely interrupt me. I think. So let's start uh, over here, how to make defect-free arrays of atoms. So in uh, the technology that we are using to trap single atoms is based on optical tweezers. So an optical tweezer, um, you might know from life sciences, you can use it to maybe have nanoparticles or control single cells under a microscope. It's actually really amazing that it also works for single atoms. So if you focus this beam very tightly, you can trap a single atom. And in this research, what we do is we use a whole array of these optical tweezers to trap multiple atoms. And then due to some atomic physics, an effect that's called light assisted collision. Actually, you can only load a single atom into these tweezers. As soon as you load two atoms into the tweezers and you're also excited, you will lose both atoms. This way you actually end up yeah, with some of these tweezer sites filled and some of them empty. But it's actually a great effect because you never have more than one atom. You just have either one or zero atom. But it's actually, if you wanted to now build a large quantum system, it's maybe not the best starting point, you have a lot of defects, but uh, what uh, we at Harvard and other groups, for example, in Paris and also uh, in, in Korea, have developed this kind of an active feedback protocol where you first randomly load these atoms, and then you take an image, you identify where are the atoms, you get rid of the empty traps, and then you move uh, the remaining traps where you want them, and now you have a defect-free array. This could be then the starting point from where you engineer interactions. There are multiple ways how you could engineer interactions. I will show you uh, two ways. One based on Rydberg uh, excitations where you excite the atoms to very highly excited Rydberg states that they can interact very strongly. But you could also engineer interactions by maybe having photon mediated interactions by coupling atoms to photonic structure. So these are the two directions. How is this done in practice? I'm an experimentalist, so I like to uh, show how things look and work in the lab. So uh, this particular way of rearrangement, the way we do this is we use an acousto optic deflector. This is a device where you send in a beam of light and you also send in a radio frequency tone. And uh, the result of this, uh, yeah, the radio frequency tone, since it's RF, you can just uh, generate maybe on a computer. And this will deflect this uh, laser beam here. And then actually the deflection angle that comes out of the AOD uh, is determined by the frequency of the RF tone. So when you change the RF tone, you can change the deflection angles. If you send multiple RF tones, you also get multiple beams of light out of this. And now you can use these multiple, this basically fan out of these beams and image that into a vacuum chamber using a high resolution microscope objective. And now here in the middle, in this high vacuum chamber, you would have these tightly focused beams that can trap single yeah. atoms. Can I ask you a question, Hannes? Yes, excellent. Yes. Jim, <laughs> Jim has a technical question. Um, Jim, do you want to ask or should I repeat it? 
Oh, it's okay. I mean, I can ask it. Uh, you have a, a, a intensity profile laterally there, which is very narrow in the uh, transverse direction, but but uh, not so narrow in the vertical direction in your picture right here. And so you, do you get anisotropic trapping then? And do you have dynamics in the vertical direction that's uh, different than the dynamics in the horizontal direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So um, yeah, I think here my sketch doesn't really uh, uh, really um, display nicely how the traps then look like. We can actually, through these uh, objectives, then have a look at these traps. So this is laser light that we tightly focus. And it's actually both kind of horizontally and vertically uh, focused. So it's really a, a, a small laser spot that confines it in yeah, both transversal directions here and also longitudinal uh, here in the longitudinal direction, it is also focused and, and also can localize then the atom here in the middle. Great question. Oh, okay, the okay, yeah, great, thank you. So now uh, we have these tweezers. So this is just an image of laser light. These are not atoms. Uh, but then we can actually use very standard laser cooling techniques where you make a cold cloud of atoms, a magneto optical trap. This is really standard, even some uh, physics uh, experiment, undergrad experiment labs uh, now have, for example, mods that uh, students uh, create. And then from these mods, we load uh, these single atoms into these tweezers. And then we excite the atoms to get, uh, to get them to scatter some photons so we can get an information where they are. We image that on a very sensitive camera, an electron multiplied CCD camera. Uh, and then uh, we can identify where are the atoms. And this basically closes the feedback loop here to the computer because now we can decide, oh, this radio frequency, which corresponds to this trap, has an atom. So we keep it, this one does not have one, so we get rid of it. And afterwards we can sweep these radio frequency tones to put the atoms exactly where we want. Um, yeah, I am an experimentalist, so experimentalists always like to show the setup, how this looks like. And then depending uh, from uh, where you come, you find this um, they're really overwhelming. It looks like a lot of optics. But actually when you come uh, from more the cold atom community, you think, oh, this is really an empty table because often these optics, uh, these cold atom experiments, uh, they have much more optics on this. So it's actually, a relatively compact setup. I would yeah, not necessarily say simple setup because a lot of the setup actually here happens, for example, in the computer programming, how you do this uh, uh, feedback. Uh, but yeah, it is actually uh, quite nice. And then here, the heart of this setup, this is uh, the Harvard experiment, is this vacuum chamber here in this high resolution uh, microscope objective. And then here in the middle, this is where uh, these experiments then would happen. So now let's see if this works. So this is a, a larger array, a 1D array of optical tweezers. Just shine them into this uh, magneto optical trap and then take an image on the sensitive camera. And then if you do that, you would see an image like this. So you see bright spots. And now these bright spots, they really correspond to single atom. You can now really very nicely correlate okay, this trap over here has an atom. Okay, the two traps next to it don't have an atom. And then the computer can make the decision to which radio frequency tones to get rid of and which radio frequency tones to sweep. Now with that information, when the algorithm runs, you can sweep them all to, for example, this equidistant array and have now a defect-free array of, of course, a little bit of a lower number than the traps you started off with. Maybe loading efficiencies are around 60%. But also there are ways of increasing that. The group of Cindy Rieger in Boulder has found ways to basically push this up to 90% and maybe even higher. So there is some randomness in the beginning, but you get rid of it with this feedback. And here's a nice uh, video where you actually see the atoms uh, fly, starting from random positions, going into this uh, deterministic or uh, predetermined uh, deterministic position. And yeah, this is of course a very much slowed down uh, video, but yeah, the motion itself takes around uh, maybe two milliseconds here. So great. And um, yeah, and I should uh, say around the same time, the group of Antoine Brevets also has uh, realized this uh, uh, arrangement of atoms in 2D and a little later even in 3D. So that's uh, really amazing. I think it's really a powerful technique 
And you see actually that uh, this doesn't only work for these atoms, these are rubidium atoms, but also other groups. Here's just an example, HIP now uh, done this kind of trapping. For example, here's the group of uh, uh, Manuel Andres, where Jay Covey also worked as a postdoc and really uh, pioneered these techniques also with strontium atoms. This is the group of Adam Kaufman, strontium atoms, uh, also in optical tweezers. Both groups have, for example, applied these tweezer arrays also to atomic clocks, which is really uh, uh, fantastic. Also, there are ytterbium atoms in a group of uh, Jeff Thompson. And not just kind of atoms, but even molecules can be trapped in these optical tweezers. So, so it's, I think it's uh, yeah, a really powerful technique, not just yeah, for this one particular kind of atom, but for atoms and molecules and can be applied for clocks and simulation and quantum computation. So I think that's uh, really exciting. So now what have we achieved? We have now this new way of assembling a larger system, but you might argue this system is still a little bit boring. You have now nice bright spots. You can take nice pictures, nice little videos and images. But so far this atom here is completely independent from any other atom in this array. And of course things get way more interesting if you could make them interact and then maybe uh, study for example, dynamics under these interactions or use these interactions to, for example, perform quantum information tasks like creating entanglement and performing gates. So how can you make these interactions? I already said there are multiple ways, but one way that is, I would say, particularly well suited for these tweezer arrays is to take these atoms and excite this ground state atom, take this outer electron and really promote it to a very high outer electron shell, excite it to a grid box. And the way I think about Rydberg atoms um, is basically that Rydberg atoms are in, I would say, an exaggerated version of your normal atom. Here's rubidium in the 5s ground state. If you're excited to the 70s state, literally the size of the atom really increases from a fraction of a nanometer to hundreds of nanometers. Now you can already imagine maybe not just the size increases, but also if you had another atom close by, then you could get really strong interactions that are uh, um, basically dipole-dipole interactions between these atoms. And these strengths are really sizable even over distances of a few micrometers. That is the typical uh, spacing between these optical tweezers. And yeah, that's why I think this is a really nice kind of marriage of these two technique tweezers with uh, Rydberg to yeah, explore interactions that are really strong even over these large distances. And now you can just use atomic um, tools, for example, to coherently excite the atom from the ground state to the Rydberg state, for example, drive Rabi oscillations you see here for isolated atoms. So these are atoms that don't interact. And you see uh, that you have quite some coherence over a few microseconds. You hardly see any decay. You have quite a few oscillations. So you can really prepare superposition between ground and Rydberg state or put it completely into the Rydberg state. Yeah, so this is just the uh, level of control that we now uh, have and that is uh, really enabling these uh, experiments. But again, these are just uh, isolated atoms and you can coherently control them. Everything gets interesting when you now make them interact. Now let's think about two atoms and what happens when they get close to each other. And think of the two atoms just again, it's two level systems. You have a ground state and a Rydberg state. Now between the two atoms here, both could be in a ground state or one of them could be in a Rydberg state. Ah, here's a nice typo. So this should be the left is Rydberg, the right is ground, and here the left is ground, and here the right is uh, Rydberg. Um, yeah, so these are the two possibilities. But then of course, both also could be in principle in a Rydberg state, but when, if both were in a Rydberg state, you would get these really strong interactions. So if you just have uh, this one laser frequency that couples to the singly excited manifold, then actually this Rydberg, Rydberg state will be shifted in energy. You cannot excite it here from uh, the singly uh, excited manifold. So this is in effect the so-called Rydberg blockade. And actually, uh, if you look at this, actually the uh, Rydberg excitation will couple to the symmetric superposition of these two states. So it's basically these two atoms, even though there are four possible states, they effectively form a two level system. And you can drive now coherently between both in the ground state and this W state, basically an entangled state where one Rydberg excitation is shared between the two atoms. So basically now by 
driving this by applying a pi pulse on this, you can make an entangled state. So this is uh, something uh, uh, we did here where we yeah, basically just did a pi pulse in between and then uh, read the state out. Okay, and the, the readout was a little bit more complicated because you also want to read out the phase here to then make a density matrix. But from that, we could deduce that we have an entanglement fidelity of 97%, which yeah is really uh, quite high. And now actually recently, this has been pushed even higher by uh, pioneers like uh, uh, Jade Covey. This is uh, uh, data now from 2020 or maybe 2019. Uh, from the Andrews group at Caltech. And here you see oscillations between two strontium atoms, both on the ground state, and here this singly excited manifold. So here you could also drive a pi pulse and create uh, an entangled state. And from these very high contrast Rabi oscillations here, uh, the group uh, deduced an entanglement uh, fidelity of 99% or lower by about on this entanglement fidelity. So that's really exciting. But now, actually, this entanglement is only between the ground state and the Rydberg state. Atoms actually have uh, much better qubit states than the Rydberg state, which will eventually decay. They have these different hyperfine states that are very long-lived qubit states. And uh, you can actually combine this Rydberg interactions with these very long-lived uh, uh, long qubits uh, to then perform, uh, for example, gates and entanglement. And yeah, how you uh, do that was proposed in 2000. So it's actually quite some time back. And yeah, the fidelity in these kind of experiments for quite some time has maybe remained, I would say, between 80% uh, yeah, uh, roughly speaking. And, and um, I think here is a very nice example where in, in 2016 or 2017, I think we all, the community got together in a workshop and kind of compared what is limiting the fidelities what could be causing this and kind of together we identify what the main sources are and what we should uh, really control and that might be different for different experiments but for us uh, it turned out and for many other experiments that actually um, the laser phase noise matters a lot so we uh, got quite a bit better at handling our laser frequency locking our laser frequencies that excite these rework atoms and with that we could then uh, really uh, push these fidelities so here you now see Rabi oscillations between uh, these hyperfine states. So this is now the hyperfine uh, uh, control combined with the Ripper control. And with this, we could uh, uh, combine this and, for example, perform a C not gate. Now between these hyperfine uh, qubit states mediated by the Ripper state uh, with quite a high fidelity of 96.5%. And I think uh, the Harvard group since then has pushed it uh, even higher. So, so there's yeah, there's a very a good promise that this can be a very high fidelity operation. What's uh, really great about uh, Rydberg atoms or Rydberg interactions is that they are not necessarily only nearest neighbor. Rydberg atoms could, for example, these interactions could uh, lead to uh, interactions with multiple atoms over several array size. You can very naturally use that also to perform multi-qubit gates, for example, a three-qubit Toffoli gate here, that of course you could also kind of write in some combination of two qubit and one qubit gates. But if the platform kind of gives it to you naturally, just like this Rydberg platform, you save a lot of uh, operations. And I think uh, this is really promising to explore how you could maybe efficiently compile quantum algorithms on this Rydberg platform. And yeah, here's also a really great experiment from the Safman group at uh, Wisconsin that also has done high fidelity two qubit gates in a really large uh, 2D uh, atom array. So with this, now I want to uh, switch gears and more go into this quantum uh, simulation area. <clears throat> so so uh, we, we've used now Rydberg interactions for gates. Now let's use them to simulate spin Hamiltonians. And actually the Hamiltonian that describes your Rydberg, uh, your atom array, when you couple it to uh, Rydberg states, is written here and actually this Hamiltonian takes the shape of a basic icing uh, Hamiltonian. There are three terms here. This is uh, the sigma x term. Basically it's just exciting or it's driving coherently from the ground state to the Rydberg state. Here you have a term where n basically just counts if you have a Rydberg uh, atom on site i. Here's a term that scales with the detuning, your laser detuning. 
And here's a term that is this Rydberg interaction between atom at site I and atom at site J. And this Hamiltonian uh, gives rise to an interesting phase diagram. And uh, this way, we can actually understand these terms quite nicely. I've plotted it here as a function of this detuning and the interaction range. Let's forget about interactions first and only focus on this term. Basically, this term is like a chemical potential. It counts uh, like, uh, yeah, it just looks at do you have a Rydberg excitation and it uh, attaches some energy cost to it. So if this detuning was large and negative, so all the way over here, this term would become large and positive. So it costs a lot of energy to put a Rydberg atom in there. So you would expect that in the ground state, all the atoms are just here in this electronic ground state. If you sweep this detuning to positive, okay, suddenly you can lower your energy by putting a Rydberg atom uh, there. You would expect to find all the atoms in the Rydberg state. Now let's make it more interesting. Let's switch on these interactions over here. And if we do that and think about it again, is this Rydberg blockade? Let's put, for example, atoms uh, relatively uh, a little bit uh, space out that only atoms uh, that are nearest neighbors are blockaded. So basically it would be impossible to put two Rydberg atoms next to each other, but it would be possible to put it on the uh, uh, second side after that. And then the ground state you would expect to find is basically Rydberg ground, Rydberg ground. So here you see the connection also to the Ising Hamiltonian. If you think about this as spins, it would be spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, just like an anti -parallel. But you can actually um, yeah, make it more interesting. Could, for example, increase the interaction range to the level where three atoms are blockaded, and you would have Rydberg, ground, ground, Rydberg, or maybe even four, then it's uh, Rydberg, ground, 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 Rydberg. You can actually now explore all these um, different phases by tuning these parameters. And basically, this is just your laser intensity. This is just the detuning of your laser, and this is just in some sense, uh, the distance between the atoms, which you control by putting them uh, in these uh, tweezers that are different in space. So now the way to explore them, you can start, for example, with all the atoms in the electronic ground state. You switch on your laser and you sweep the detuning from negative to positive. And if you look at the atoms, what happens as you do this, as you sweep this detuning, you see all the atoms start in the ground state. This is by dark color. And then if you go to positive detuning, you basically have Rydberg, ground, Rydberg, ground, exactly what you would expect. And I find it actually really fascinating to look at these uh, fluorescence images where in the beginning you see all the atoms and afterwards every second atom got lost. Actually these Rydberg atoms in these experiments here, they are not trapped, so they fly away. And that's actually a great way of actually detecting where these Rydberg excitations are and detecting now this order that has emerged in this new phase. Now, by simply putting the atoms closer to each other, you can also explore this other phase, Rydberg, ground, ground, Rydberg, ground, ground. Uh, and you can also uh, explore this D4 order space, uh, uh, phase. So simply by changing the interaction range, by putting the atoms closer, as you see here in the fluorescence images, uh, you explore different uh, phases uh, on this array. Of course, when you talk to maybe condensed matter theorists, they're not really convinced that you are probing uh, phase transitions here because it's only 13 atoms. It's a very finite size. So we try to uh, go a little bit uh, more larger size. And this is uh, the largest array that we did at that time. This is a 51 atom array. And we arrange them here also in this Z2 spacing. And now if we do the same sweep, again, you find uh, these ordered uh, phases. You find uh, Rydberg ground, Rydberg ground, but sometimes you see also defects where you have maybe two Rydbergs uh, next to each other. And yeah, these defects appear maybe in every sweep somewhere else. But actually you do get quite significant long order. And you can actually sometimes even, uh, even see like a whole ordered array across the whole atomic array. And this is basically a histogram of how often that happens that, that you get a complete order here it was maybe in 0.1% of the cases. Uh, and uh, there are also detection infidelities. So maybe it was uh, around 1%. Recently, I think these numbers go up to maybe even 10%. So it's kind of an indication that you have really quite some coherence across the whole array that you can uh, use here. And uh, another thing that also points in that direction is that you see very long correlation length here of five sites. And I think, uh, these correlation lengths, they now really approach kind of the system sizes. And 
yeah, another thing uh, that we really investigated was what is limiting this correlation length. It's, for example, these defects are limiting that, but where do they come from? Some of them could happen because maybe sometimes you spontaneously emit a photon or scatter a photon, but some of these defects, they are actually related to interesting physics that are related to how fast do you go into this new phase. If you, for example, go very slow, you would have less defects. If you go very fast, you get a more defect. And this is related to the Kibbutz-Zurek mechanism that here we probed for a quantum phase transition and really saw the scaling that was predicted uh, for uh, such a Kibbutz-Zurek mechanism at a quantum phase transition. So I said, uh, I said that these techniques, kind of these quantum simulation techniques, they are also very useful in, uh, in a uh, maybe more quantum information uh, context and you can actually use these uh, sweeping techniques to create large entangled states. I've shown you so far only odd number of uh, atom arrays. I've shown you 30 and 51. But what happens if you just have an even uh, a number and you arrange them that you would have like the nearest atoms blockaded but the next nearest uh, not blockaded. So you could have a Rydberg atom here and then again here or you could have this state and you could kind of guess yeah maybe they could become entangled if you sweep into the state, but there's actually one more state where you could have a Rydberg atom uh, at the edges. And yeah, this, this state contributes uh, in a way that you actually uh, don't want. So what you could do, you could actually penalize this state by putting a light shift on these outer atoms and then uh, sweep really into an entangled state where you only have these two contributions. So that's uh, easy enough to do. And uh, we did this. You can actually look at the energy spectra for these four atoms, when you start at this negative to tuning, all the atoms would be in the ground state. And if you now slowly sweep, you would follow into this entangled state of positive to tuning. And if you do this sweep uh, on uh, atoms, then indeed uh, after the sweep, we found that we do find these uh, combinations. Uh, so, so these two, um, yeah, these two contributions uh, with very high uh, chance. So this really looks like entanglement. But of course, to prove entanglement, you also really want to measure this uh, phase. And yeah, there we used uh, a phase shift that we applied now to two of these atoms. And then the entangled state would uh, uh, basically pick up a phase over here. And yeah, we can measure this phase by rotating the bases, measuring the parity of these atoms. And then we see these nice oscillations uh, that show that we have entanglement. And yeah, the entanglement you can deduce from here is a lower bound of 85% now between uh, these four atoms. And um, yeah, simple enough. You could now just use these tweezer uh, protocols to go to larger arrays. And uh, this is uh, what we have, have done. A question, Hannes. Yeah, excellent. Okay. I, I don't really understand the question, but maybe. Paiwen, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you? Oh, yeah. Can you okay, hear yeah. me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, cool. Um, so there is a quantum scars phenomenon in the 13 and 7 um, river atoms, so right, right? Can you talk about that? Yes, I can talk about that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very interesting topic. So, so all that I'm showing right now, I would say, are uh, uh, very largely just uh, ground state physics. We try to sweep, we stay in the ground state of these uh, Hamiltonians. But nothing stops you from, for example, very abruptly changing the detuning and suddenly kind of jumping, for example, to exactly the phase transition or close to that. And then you can study what basically uh, the array does. You can study these dynamics. And there was really, yeah, the really nice insight that you can look for each atom. What happens. And we, we have done that where we started with all the atoms in the ground state and then we just jumped basically to this V2 phase transition where you would have Rydberg ground, Rydberg ground. And then what we saw actually is that the, um, that the whole system oscillates in a very interesting way where you would have ground, Rydberg ground, Rydberg, and then it oscillates to Rydberg ground, Rydberg ground. And that actually these uh, states, they were very robust and these were very special states. If you kind of change the system uh, like a little bit, then you would normally expect that the system very quickly uh, thermalizes. But there are these special states, many body states that are now called uh, quantum scars that show um, that are more robust to thermalization. And that has actually become kind of a field of study uh, by itself 
it's, it's quite a large field and I, I chose not to go too much into detail here, uh, but we can talk after the talk, uh, of course, uh, if you're interested. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. But excellent. But I think uh, the, the, maybe the message to take here is we can study not only ground state physics, but also dynamics, which is, of course, hugely exciting and study how these states thermalize. Um, here, I just wanted to show more this type of ground state physics where we have created an entangled state. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, how did I do that? That's interesting. Uh, yeah, where we have created an entangled state uh, between 20 atoms. Here you see these parity oscillations for 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. And yeah, if we deduce uh, fidelity from that, you see here uh, that even for 20 atoms, we still have a, a entanglement fidelity larger than 50%. Uh, we have a fully entangled GHC state here. Great, so now I think I have to speed up a little bit my talk, but uh, now uh, it actually yeah, gets quite exciting because now I want to show you what research directions we are doing here uh, at New Chicago. And okay, now it's remote time and I love giving lab tours. The best I can do here is a little remote lab tour. So our labs, uh, they are here in the Eckert Research Center. And yeah, I welcome everybody to uh, visit the labs once uh, this pandemic is over. But here's my remote tour. We are in the basement. So the, the, this is all a very new lab space. And here, let's enter the uh, door over here into our labs and yeah, the labs consist of two big main labs, I would say, and some yeah, areas, preparation labs around that. And we have this one lab I would call the atom array lab where we really uh, yeah, go into this atom array direction and I will show you the directions we are thinking of. And then we have this quantum network lab where we combine these atoms with photonic interfaces. Let's first uh, look into this left lab a little bit more. I've shown you the setup uh, from uh, my postdoc time at Harvard. So here's now what this looks uh, at Chicago. A lot of things you might uh, recognize also uh, from a previous thing here, the vacuum chamber is kind of a little bit flipped 90 degrees, it's upside down, it's just pointing downwards and down here is actually where we do our experiments or where the interesting, uh, the real interesting things happen. And here, this is what you see here, a microscope objectives, and yeah, but uh, yeah, we designed this vacuum chamber having in mind that we would like to trap really large arrays. And one thing that limits the size of the array is actually the vacuum that you have. So, so you want to have really high vacuum that there's no chance that maybe some background atoms kicks you out of the, uh, of the tweezer. So the way we do that, we have our atomic source up here. For the experts, this is a 2D uh, magneto optical trap. So we keep kind of the high density atom stuff away. Then we push these uh, atoms down here and trap them uh, over here. And that uh, allows us to uh, get much better vacuum down here and hopefully get much longer atom uh, lifetime. Actually, yeah, before the pandemic, this was just an empty table. We've been really, uh, yeah, I think making fast progress uh, since we were back in lab uh, by mid-June. Now in, in September, here's a nice picture <coughs> from a magneto-optical trap of rubidium atoms. This looks... Uh, really pretty. You also see there's something special in this uh, vacuum chamber and I will talk about that, uh, what this is. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I told you that we really want to go to very large arrays. I think uh, kind of with a decent field of view of a microscope objective, you can basically fit maybe 10,000 traps into that tweezers. Each tweezer maybe costs you a milliwatt in laser power. You can definitely get a, a few watts of powers. So in principle, you should go to be able to go to thousands of trap. Of course, you still have to rearrange atoms. I do find it uh, very uh, conceivable that soon we will see atomic arrays with more than a thousand atoms. And in that direction, we are now also making new trap arrays. So here you see a nice uh, trap array. This is not made with these AODs, but it's uh, made with a spatial light modulator. You see this trap. So I again emphasize these are not single atoms, but this is just the trapping light. But the trapping light is very nicely focused, so I'm uh, completely convinced that when we shine this into our, uh, into our magneto-optical trap, which will be very soon, we will be uh, able to trap uh, atoms in this. And um, the other thing, the other direction how we also want to go big is actually with these uh, Rydberg states. So here I, I plotted what I would expect the blockade radius to be of a 70S Rydberg state here, kind of the experiments I've shown you previously 
where maybe two, three, or four atoms were blockaded. Now, if you imagine you go from a 70s state to maybe a 90s state, this uh, interaction really scales very dramatically with n to the 11th power. So suddenly this blockade radius would be way larger and way more atoms could interact uh, with each other. Of course, if you want that, you could always choose to work with lower redox states or spread the atoms uh, further out. But there might be a really interesting regimes where you want very strong interactions or just very large connectivity if you perform gates between atoms that are far away. So you don't have to, I don't know, perform swap gates in between, but you can just perform a gate over the whole array site here or a large portion. But uh, what stops you to actually go to these high redox states or at least based on the experience we made with this Harvard experiment, is that you also become very sensitive to electric field. And that's exactly what you saw in this vacuum chamber. Uh, what that actually is, I would say, is a Faraday cage, but it's a bit more than a Faraday cage. It's actually a combination of six independent uh, electrodes that we can uh, apply electric fields to. But at the same time, it can also shield from electric fields. And here's a nice simulation that Kevin Singh, uh, the postdoc on this project, has done where he applied an electric field to this Faraday cage from the outside and he saw this huge suppression inside the Faraday cage. I think the factor here was uh, about three orders of magnitude. So it should really allow us to go to these very high Rydberg states and uh, yeah, we will try that uh, very soon. The other thing that's quite uh, special, I believe, or which is yeah, well, one thing that we do in, in this atomic array is that we are not just trapping rubidium atom, we are also trapping cesium atoms, so it's a two species array. Actually, here you see a picture of the cesium mod. This is at a different wavelength, 850, so you can't take as pretty pictures with your mobile phone uh, like before. But um, uh, yeah, here's on an infrared camera, you also see a very big mod here. So this is actually, yeah, I would say like centimeters. So this is a healthy mod, how people say. Uh, and then now you have two atoms and uh, two atomic species. And we actually have it all set up that you can really completely uh, independently position them. So you could uh, position them in this grid, for example, yeah, in this way. And uh, you can address them now completely independently with different sets of lasers. And what this would, for example, allow you to do is to um, read one atom out without affecting the other atom. Still, if you want the atoms to interact, you can uh, uh, excite them to Rydberg states and then they uh, interact uh, just uh, the way you would expect. So you can map the state maybe of one qubit onto the other qubit and then read it out. Or you could map the state of multiple qubits onto one qubit and read it out. Or use that, for example, to control a large set of qubits and, for example, make a large entangled state by having all these qubits interact just with one uh, uh, state that you control and read out. Actually, yeah, I, I, I painted this here a little bit suggestively. We are thinking, for example, about uh, implementations of surface code where you would now, for example, map the stabilizer of surrounding qubits onto your ancilla qubit and you would read it out and you could then maybe even uh, do a step of feedback on this. Another very interesting direction here is... Can I the way with a question, Hannes? Yeah. Oh, can, uh, can you, uh, Pei Wen, can you uh, oh, yeah. repeat your this question? Uh, yeah, does the black body radiation induce decay matter? Your yeah, yeah. The, these are really expert questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so black body uh, radiation does coupled to Rydberg states can cause them to decay. And that's something to keep in mind. It kind of sets the time scales of these experiments for how long can you experiment. And I think it gives you kind of time scales of maybe tens of microseconds uh, where you don't have to worry about it too much. But if you wanted to go longer, there are ways of getting rid of it. You could think about cryogenic setups and quite, uh, yeah, there are a few efforts underway and we are also thinking a little bit about that to get rid of black body radiation. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, here's another direction that we are thinking of, but we're largely inspired by also our collaboration with Ashish Clark. If you now had two different species of atoms and you control the coupling between them, you could, for example, also study many body dynamics under engineered dissipation. Maybe you could use one system as the bath, one uh, atomic species as the bath, the other as the system. Use maybe these dissipation channels to uh, control and engineer interesting quantum states. Yeah, I'm running a little bit out of time. I will go a tiny bit fast over this. We are also thinking about uh, topological uh, 
phenomena. You could arrange these atoms not just in a regular grid, but maybe in a honeycomb lattice. We're thinking uh, of studying, for example, edge currents with the simulation of that uh, in these maybe topological systems that you set up like that. And it's really interesting because now you would have single side control and readout. You could study the robustness under this order. There's a very nice paper that has done that or similar things with three atoms and we hope to go to larger sizes. Another thing that's very interesting are also these magnetic uh, models where you could now in 2D arrange them with a lot of frustration and maybe uh, even study a uh, quantum spin liquids. So now in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to switch to this other lab on the right side. So I've shown you now the atom array lab and I really think, yeah, we have now the techniques to really explore quantum information on large arrays, quantum simulation on large arrays, and really push this further to thousands of atoms. And I think the thing that is really needed is new control techniques that you can then really independently control them. And yeah, I think there's a lot of progress to be made. But I'm very excited about the second axis here. And that's uh, the distance between the qubits. And uh, yeah, for that, uh, the architecture we are thinking about is this uh, architecture based on nanophotonics where atoms coupled to nanophotonic crystal cavities that provide an efficient light matter interface. And now you could take yeah, the photons that are emitted to distant nodes and then connect distant nodes with each other. And uh, this is kind of, I mean, these experiments are very exciting and I think there have been already quite some experiments. Here's just a little sample of different platforms that have done these two qubit entanglement experiments. And, and Wolfgang and I, we had a lot of fun here in 2013, also participating in that. And I've uh, kind of grouped that by coherence, time, and entanglement rate. So, so some systems are maybe very coherent, uh, but the entanglement rate is slow. That's what you see on this. There, there's a different way of looking at it. You can actually uh, look at a quantity called the quantum link efficiency, I would say introduced maybe by Chris Monroe's group, where you look at, okay, what's the ratio between the entanglement rate over the decoherence? So basically, can you entangle faster and then you lose your quantum state? And if you replot this on, on this graph here, you see actually that all the experiments, they follow kind of the same curve. It's just uh, the, with the distance, the link efficiency just goes down. And this is largely due that yeah, as you increase the distance, you get more losses. And most of these different, uh, different systems here, they are not really optimized. They don't work at telecom wavelengths, so you have a lot of fiber losses. So what we are really interested in is using atoms coupled to nanophotonics working at telecom wavelengths. So we want to use the nanophotonics as the efficient light matter interfaces. So these are nanophotonic crystal cavities and use our atoms in the tweezers. And then when you combine the two things, here's a little diagram, and you can actually trap atoms very close to this nanophotonic crystal cavity. Oh, sorry. You have a, a strong, uh, you have like the standing wave forming. It puts the atom very close and then you can strongly uh, couple uh, the atom to this. And what we would like to do in our research uh, is actually do that at telecom wavelengths. So not uh, with, again, with atoms like rubidium and uh, cesium, but not between the ground state and maybe uh, the first excited state at 780 nanometers, but actually go to other uh, states. And you can, oh, sorry. Uh, you, you can find these uh, telecom transitions here between uh, excited states. We want to use these excited states to get telecom photons out while keeping the atom coherence here in the ground state. There's also a very nice related proposal by uh, Jake using ytterbium that gives you kind of a similar, uh, similar structure, but with uh, yeah, almost telecom transition to a very long lived metasteroid state. So the way we do uh, our protocol is by using yeah, something we call the diamond scheme. Basically take our atom, our qubit state on a little round trip, go to this excited state, have a cavity here at the telecom and get the telecom photon. And yeah, the goal here is to entangle now these hyperfine states with a photon emitted. And yeah, we like to use the time degree of freedom. So it would be a photon either emitted early or late. So basically we do two little round trips and, and uh, either a photon is emitted in the first or in the second and actually it's in the superposition of the two. And yeah, uh, my student Shankar has uh, simulated this. So this is now a pulse a scheme where here in the top you see these uh, 
you, you, sorry, uh, you see the prices that we apply to the atom. So this is a pi sticking it up here. From there, we take it with a laser to E2, and then we let it decay. And down here, you see the atom population. We first start in this zero state here. We are initialized, and we end up in this zero state in the end again. But in between, we went through this cavity emission and have gotten a telecom photo now. So that's uh, the basic scheme. And yeah, uh, what Shankar really, uh, ah, and, and in this scheme, we, we calculated the fidelity. So kind of what is the error we make in this entangled state based on how strongly we couple to the cavity. So what our cooperativity is. We see that with decent cooperativities that have already been demonstrated in the experiment, we can get actually a quite high fidelity entangled state. Of course, in reality, there are many more atomic states that you might maybe couple to, and this coupling depends uh, a lot uh, on, for example, the polarization of your, of your light field. And this polarization yeah, could maybe lead to coupling to other states. The polarization is largely affected by these nanophotonic structures. So Shankar, my student, he simulated all these polarization impurities, then simulated the full protocol under realistic assumptions and found that indeed you can get a, a highly entangled state between the atom and the photon using this scheme. So this is now uh, what we are really pushing for in the lab and just showing you the recent progress uh, yeah, pushed forward by these uh, three uh, amazing students is that we have made uh, really nice cavities now in the clean room. Uh, this is done in collaboration with Alan Devos at Argonne National Lab. Um, these cavities, I think uh, just last week, uh, we have measure, measured our first Q factors. And I think for our first attempt, these are actually really high Q factors. So the Q factors uh, later together with how close you get the atom uh, determines the cooperativity. And yeah, this looks very promising to get into this high cooperativity regime. And I expect that this uh, number will now go up. And we have also made these fast optical pulses. Actually, we have to have these fast pulses to make the scheme. And we have now made uh, pulses using an electro optic modulator uh, with less than 200 picoseconds. I was actually yeah, very surprised that that's possible. Uh, something we worked uh, also, Wolfgang and I in the PhD, a lot on. And we only went to nanoseconds. Now it's actually uh, below nanoseconds. It's a, a very nice high contrast pipe. So that's really important. We also have designed a new vacuum chamber for this. It's a very compact vacuum chamber. So you can really think of this maybe as an atomic node and maybe you could even an uh, atomic network node and you could maybe even copy paste that and uh, place that as a distance. That's what we are really excited here now looking at this kind of summary plot in this distant axis. Uh, we are now uh, implementing this atomic network node working at the telecom. We are collaborating on this quantum link or quantum loop project where there are fibers between Argon National Lab and Fermi Lab, or also a loop between Argon and Bay. We hope uh, that we can contribute, contribute to this and have our atom node there and really test this on large separations. It's also a really exciting uh, project together with Elizabeth at URUC and uh, with Tian, uh, Tian here at uh, UChicago, where you want to couple atoms to rare earth memories. Now you would have a network node that basically has a multi-mode memory, which would be really exciting. And I think uh, there's really great potential now exploring the whole region over here where you have distance between your atomic qubits, but you also have several atomic qubits. So we are thinking about quantum repeater schemes where either you perform operations between the atoms that are photomediated by coupling to the same cavity or evanescently coupling to another cavity or the dream would be actually to combine nanophotonics with also Rydberg uh, mediated gates, and maybe you could move the uh, you could move the atoms from the cavities and then perform your gate and then move them back to the cavities. So that's something we are quite excited about, thinking about repeaters, entanglement distillation. And then there's one more really exciting project. Uh, yeah, I had really interesting discussions uh, initialized by uh, Jay Covey, also together with Liang Jiang and Michael Bishop. Uh, about yeah, combining actually the capabilities that ha these atomic Tusa clocks have with these network capabilities to form an entangled uh, clock network. And here now entangling these clocks could give you more precision of these, um, of these uh, clock uh, 
the, yeah, of the clock precision and really distribute this uh, clock signal in a secure way. So that's really exciting and maybe even testing that in such a test bed or there are even fibers going to use Chicago yeah, would be uh, really amazing. I think there's really lots to do. I went a little bit over time. I want to thank you for hanging on. Thank you for your patience. Really good questions already. And I really want to thank my amazing group that I have here at uh, UChicago. And the group can still grow. So if you know, or if you are excited about uh, these things, please reach out and uh, yeah, I'd be happy to tell you more what we are exactly doing in the lab. So yeah, thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot, Hannes, for this uh, really exciting talk. Um, Thank you. Sorry, I went over time. Uh, that's all right. So, uh, there's still a lot of people in here. So, um, yeah, if people still want to ask questions, I think that would be totally okay. So, any questions for Hannes? Hey, Hannes, I got a question. Hey, Elizabeth, yeah. Um, so, you talked about going to higher Rydberg states to, to expand the number of atoms that you can get mm -hmm. gates between um what about trying to use the the dipole dipole interaction and going to like a p state oh yeah great and you have a good you have a well-defined direction so presumably you know what the mm -hmm. interaction mm -hmm. is where mm -hmm. yeah yeah no the, the this is an excellent question so indeed here the interactions i largely talked about and the experiments i've shown they excited to s states and then the, the potential is like one over R to the six. So it actually decays pretty fast and you have to go to very high states. You could indeed go to other Rydberg states like P states or D states that maybe have a one over R three or like a much larger interaction. And that's something we definitely also are thinking about and want to develop because it's also great if you go to P states, you can actually get different kind of interaction terms. You could have not just sigma z, sigma z interactions, like in this Ising type interaction, but you could also have like a flip-flop interaction where maybe between the Rydberg states, you could have a P excitation that flips with the S excitation. And that's exactly kind of the physics, uh, kind of the underlying techniques we would need, for example, to explore this topological uh, uh, direction where, okay, the excitation that hops around is actually a P Rydberg excitation on kind of other atoms that are in the S state. So it's definitely uh, something that we do want to develop. And you're right, also maybe just for performing gates going to a higher Rydberg state, no, not higher, but different orbitals uh, might be really helpful. But it's, uh, it's okay, uh, yeah, yeah, no, but we are right now, we are thinking about a two photon scheme, so we would go from an S state to an S state or S state to a D state. So you need like a little bit of maybe microwave control in the Rydberg state to also go to P states, but it's definitely something we would like to develop. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. All right. Yeah, Hannes, I, I got uh, just a follow on question from what I had uh, yeah. from my thank camera you. here, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, is, is there anything in, uh, involving the, the uh, center mass motion you're in some kind of harmonic potential, I suppose, in yeah. the inverse directional, longitudinal direction of the beam. Yeah. Does, is there anything involved in that, in the quantum mm -hmm. state, or any, any of the dynamics you have here? Because I guess yeah. in, in, um, in ion traps, that's an important thing. Yeah. And maybe it's not important here, but I was just going to ask. No, 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 it's exactly a great, it's, it's a great question. So indeed, these atoms are, yeah, the, the tweezer makes a harmonic trap and they indeed move around uh, in this. It's a, like, and, and sometimes you, yeah, what, what um, in many experiments, what you try to do is to be in a regime where you're not so sensitive to that. So this motion, for example, happens on time scales that are slower than, for example, these Rydberg interaction strength or these typical excitations that are kind of microseconds. But here you have like motion that is maybe milliseconds or, or on that order. So, so in that sense, Maybe there's kind of a nice separation of motion, but it does mean maybe in every time, sometimes people call this a frozen gas regime. So you do an experiment and okay, you don't care about the motion, but of course, every time maybe your atoms are at slightly different positions. So if you were very sensitive to what exactly the interaction strength between the atom is, this would vary from shot to shot. So that could be bad, but a lot of experiments and the ones I have shown they basically rely on this Rydberg blockade. And then it doesn't matter so much if you're 
I don't know, super blockaded or a little less blockaded or you are simply blockaded, you don't excite to these states and then the exact value of the interaction does not matter. But there could be regimes where you're very sensitive to that. So it's something definitely to take into account. Also this motion might lead to Doppler shift. So you must think about kind of, uh, do you have like some Doppler shift when you excite the atoms? So it's something to take into account. And people in these optical tweezers, and especially ytterbium, strontium are very good for that. They have cooled the atoms also to the uh, ground state. So, so, so where uh, this motion is maybe less of a concern. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, thank you, excellent. Uh, anyone else? Uh, maybe I have a technical question. <laughs> very Please. related to Jim's question, actually. So now you gain basically what's kind of nice about these systems, if you want to build larger things, is that they're indistinguishable fundamentally. Yeah. But to what extent, not only, let's say, in trap motion, but generally, do you predict you have to pay for in um, disorder in your control fields, generally speaking? Say, like, you want to mm -hmm. run like something like you should, like a surface code or something like that in some really big array. But now you have all these beams, there will be microwaves, there's laser light and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. To what extent will it be difficult for you to get below some error threshold mm -hmm. uniformly? Say yeah. Like, um, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's an excellent question. And often, maybe the perspective I have is, okay, it's great, atoms are scalable and you can <laughs> spread them out and they are all the same. But actually the challenge is very much on the control side. Like you, you're pointing, can you really homogeneously couple this one and that one? You have to think about crosstalk. Of course, you some of this control you're doing by focusing laser beams, but okay, maybe it's a Gaussian and okay, it doesn't really decay to zero very steeply or so. So, so yeah, you might have crosstalk. So yeah, the control is extremely important. And I think that's really uh, kind of the challenge that we have to work on. It is, it is very nice that this control, I mean, since you have this single atom readout, you can actually do very nice feedback. For example, you can feedback on the tweezer depths, make them all equal in depth. You can feedback now if you had this control and all the Rabi frequencies so that they all have the same uh, Rabi frequency. But yeah, that, that maybe also becomes kind of a calibration problem and how long can you keep, uh, keep this stable? Um, yeah, I think that's exactly the right question and I think that's really what we have to work on. But um, in principle, especially like uh, for these experiments I've shown you where we just couple all the atoms to Rydberg state, uh, you can just have large laser beams that are very homogeneous across the whole array. You can also use light shaping techniques, make potential of these laser beams that are very uh, uh, homogeneous. Yeah, thanks. Cool, thank you. If there's nobody else, then I, I had a quick question. Oh, excellent. Hey. Hey, Hannes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering how uh, in the silicon nitride uh, array of the mm -hmm. photonic crystals that you showed, uh, yeah. how, how are your students coupling out of those crystals? Hmm. Yeah. That's that's a. Excellent question. I, I really like that question <laughs> because, um, yeah, here one way of, of coupling to these uh, photonic crystal structures is to use tapered fibers. So you could uh, attach a fiber to this and then through the same fiber you can send light and you design these cavities that they are single-sided. So the back mirror is much more reflective than the front mirror. So you also interrogate them out of that. In our setup, what we are actually uh, very uh, interested in is actually to couple free space into these devices. So, so um, I, I don't have a picture of that, but we have devices where basically they are just attached on one end and, and then you just have to test it here and then you would come with the light uh, through a microscope objective and couple free space to these devices. I think what the nice thing would be now, you can basically couple to this device or you change your microscope objective, you couple to another device. It's not just one cavity, one fiber, but you can actually explore multiple cavities, maybe even explore some of these quantum network protocols first, just in the same, yeah, in the first, uh, in the same vacuum chamber, you could maybe address multiple uh, cavities. We also want to put an array into this, so have also multiple atoms that couple maybe to multiple cavities. Thank you. And you're able to get uh, reasonable cu coupling efficiencies, free space? Uh, yes, simulation so yes. And, and uh, we are quite confident because uh, also the group of Jeff Kimball is doing this now and they have seen, uh, I think, 
coupling efficiencies of 70, 80 uh, percent, and maybe simulations even indicate that you could go higher. And I think that's really, really promising. And I also think maybe nanophotonic, like these fiber tapers, can sometimes get you higher efficiencies. But in the end, these protocols, these entanglement protocols, they are often probabilistic protocols. So you have a hair riding event where you maybe uh, condition on detecting photons and then entangle the uh, atom. So in that scenario, I actually don't think it's so important if it's 70% or 90%. It will never be 100%. So you will always uh, kind of have to rely on the hair riding event. All right, thank you. Thank you, great question. Mm, there's nobody else now. <laughs> Do you want to take it back, Elizabeth? Uh, sure. Well, thanks yeah. everyone for uh, coming, and we'll see you next week for Dirk. And thanks, Hannes, yeah. for a great thank talk. You. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for great questions, everybody. And yeah, thank you for hanging out so long. Sorry, it went over. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> can I? Bye. Can I still hang out a little bit more? Yeah, I can hang on for, for okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned that laser phase noise is the like the main issue. Yeah. Uh, well, um, can I, you so it, essentially you want to reduce the laser line width, right? You want to reduce the laser line width? Yeah. I, I would say yes, but it's also often like what what we for example didn't realize or I didn't realize and other people would uh, for, of course, it's, it's not just maybe simple one Lorentzian line width. You could maybe have other features in this that are maybe uh, uh, that come from the way you lock. You could have these lock servo bumps and maybe these servo bumps could be at frequencies you are very sensitive uh, to. So it's, yeah, you want a narrow line width, but you also want to kind of look what your spectrum looks like. And, yeah. Right, does the line width between your two vapor laser, so you use a two steps. Yeah. What is it called? Two photon, a two photon <laughs> excitation, right? Yeah. Does the noise does the noise correlation between these two lasers matter? If I lock the two lasers independently, does that destroy? I don't know. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's that's a great question. So indeed, actually, you want them to be very accurately referenced to each other. So because you want to kind of go in this two photon process, you basically want to think of the two lasers as if it was just one laser. I, that's how I think about it. And, and the way you do that is then to uh, lock it to the same kind of ultra stable cavity. Okay. Yeah. We are, uh, I'm from Brian DeMarco's group. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, uh, we're working on a 3D optical lattice. Yeah. Well. Uh, and we also have a Rippert project that we want to, we use two photon excitation, mm -hmm. but we do not have a way or enough funding to lock the two lasers uh, with the same cavity. Uh, yeah, and but, why can't uh, you lock to the same cavity? Sorry, it's, it's a different wavelength, so it doesn't work? Yeah, uh, it's potassium 40. Mm -hmm. So the lower transition is at 405 nanometer. The upper mm -hmm. transition is at 980 nanometer. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so this very two different uh, yeah. wavelengths. So yeah, in our case, our cavity then has mirror coatings that works at all these different wavelengths. Because for us, for example, it's, let's say, 460 nanometer and maybe 10, 50 nanometer. So it's very different wavelengths. But you can have the coating kind of engineered that it's a very good cavity at this wavelength, also very good cavity at this wavelength. And then, okay, it's it's the same cavity, so everything is kind of common mode uh, uh, when, when you lock the two lasers. Okay. But did anyone done the simulation that clearly says that the noise difference between the two, las two lasers matter, or is it just like a... Well, I would exactly. imagine if you do lock it kind of to separate cavities, if now these two cavities kind of independently drift from each other, then, for right. example, your resonance condition that the two frequencies together, they have to put you on resonance between the ground state, and the Rydberg state or the ground state and your telecom state you are interested in. Now this would kind of drift. So I, I, I do think it's, it's in the end, it's, it's, it's probably similar to just having a frequency shift uh, like that are independent on both of them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
but I, I don't say that it's not possible. I think if you're both cavities are very stable or so, and uh, then that might be uh, completely possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Thank you for excellent questions also. Uh, thank you for your talk. Yeah. Thanks. I see in the chat there's a question by Wenchao. Uh, yeah. Hi, Hanif. <laughs> hi. Hi. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great that you're joining. Okay, cool. <laughs> great. So I'm reading your question. For the telecom conversion, could you comment on the effect of the relative short lifetime of the excited states on the coherence? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. Yeah, so, so the lifetime of the excited state is relatively short. And, and it would be bad if it just kind of spontaneously decays or, or something. That would be really bad. So, so you have to, um, that's, that's kind of why you really, everything scales with the cooperativity. So you want to very strongly couple that kind of this cavity decay is the dominant decay. But that also kind of for this scheme that we showed where everything is on resonance, put yeah. you in the regime, okay, where you have to make these short pulses. So, so, so that's why, I mean, it, it might not be so exciting to make a short pulse, but it's here very important for, for the project that you can now very quickly kind of go through these states before they decay. So it's exactly correct. The decay kind of sets a limit on this. You want to be faster, but then the time scale, like, how fast you can go is basically set by C gamma, so the cooperativity uh, times uh, times your your gamma, and yeah, we try to have that as high as possible. But then once we have that fixed, it basically tells you, okay, now your lasers have to be fast enough to really kind of make use of this C gamma. So 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 that's why yeah we want to make these short pulses with high contrast, and yeah, and that looks very good. I see. Is there some similar like EIT like thing can exist here such that you do not spend like time on this exciting yeah. stage? Yeah, we were also thinking a little bit more like with detunings and with detunings in principle, you can maybe slow things down. Also, you don't really populate it as much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we, we simulate that a little bit. Also, Johannes Beauregard, uh, who's now in Delft, he helped us a lot in that. And we actually kind of concluded that maybe in this regime where we can have these high cooperativity, that the on resonance scheme and just going fast through it is uh, maybe most common. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. So many questions. <laughs> also, I mean, if you have more questions later, we can talk any time and. Yeah, I hope pandemic is over at some point and then we also start to see each other in person and then that would be really wonderful. Yeah, maybe you will be back <laughs> after yeah. COVID. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you everybody. Uh, I will lock off now, but feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Bye.